coordinator, and I will be working behind the scenes today helping troubleshoot technical issues and also serving as a moderator. Before we begin the webinar, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items for you to maximize your learning for this session. First, you will want to leave the GoToWebinar control box located at the far right of your screen open during the presentation. Uh, we recommend you keep it open so that you can ask questions by interacting with us using the chat feature. To ask questions, as I mentioned, simply type your question in the chat feature and we will save those questions and route them to the appropriate uh, member of the presentation group. Should you experience any problems, please also type in the chat window and we will work to assist you. At the end of the session, the presentation and audio recording will be available on our website, klikuho.org, under the webinar archives resource for your future reference. We encourage you to share this with your colleagues who were unable to attend today. And at this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Habrina Shepard, one of our presenters, who will introduce herself and the other presenters. And at this time, you can go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sabrina Shepard, and I'm an area coordinator and coordinator of multicultural student services at Muskingum University. And um, Lovey, you can introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Lovey Marshall, and I am a residence hall director at the University of St. Francis in Fort Wayne. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marcus Wright, and I'm an assistant director of housing at Grand Valley State University. Okay, um, so we have some learning outcomes that we hope that everyone will gain from this webinar, and the learning outcomes that we have are professionals will gain an understanding of issues and concerns that minority students face on campuses of predominantly white institutions. Professionals will learn the best practices necessary to support and retain these students. Um, you will understand the most common microaggressions experiences on campuses by minority students, and you will be able to combat microaggressive environments um, for with the community to build a healthy community for minority my, for minority students. Now we have a few definitions for you to understand the groundwork of microaggressions. Racism is any attitude, action, institutional structure, or social policy that makes a certain or group, certain person or group, feel inferior because of their color. Institutional racism is any kind of system of inequality based on race. It can happen within different types of organizations like the government, churches, schools, businesses, and things like that. Cultural racism is an expression that one culture is better than another, and the power to impose these standards over another cultural group. Um, racial battle fatigue is similar to a combat fatigue that a lot of military personnel um, have issues with. It's when people of color develop anxiety or even stresses, stressors because they are faced with racism or different types of racial microaggressions on a daily basis. Microaggressions are brief everyday exchanges that send negative or hostile messages to certain individuals because of their group membership. And there are three different types of microaggressions. Micro assault, micro insults, and micro invalidation. Now Marcus will go into more detail about these different microaggressions. Okay, with micro assaults, micro assaults is uh, of the three groups of microaggressions that uh, Herbrina just mentioned. It's the only one that's that's conscious, where people are knowingly trying to deliberately hurt someone based on their race, gender, or sexual orientation. It's meant to affect marginalized groups, and it, they send typically cues and verbal verbalizations or different behaviors that kind of uh, you know really want to attack or hurt that particular group. So it's something that's done consciously. And when we think about that, we typically think about old-fashioned racism. So in some of these types of old-fashioned racism that we talk about and those common assaults are like racial epithets, you know, telling racial or ethnic jokes and laughing at them, you know, or forbidding marriage outside of one's race, or denial or delay of service, which is one of the most common things that we see nowadays. And this is typically not done a lot anymore in terms of the old-fashioned racism. Um, a lot of it we'll see in the other two types of uh, microaggressions. So micro in 
micro insults um, is something that's done unconsciously and it's done you know in terms of environmental communication so when you think of a micro insult it's it's a communication that someone does to someone else that they do unconsciously in terms of stereotypes rudeness insensitivity and really it's meant to demean them in terms of their race gender sexual orientation heritage or anything um, that they identify with and those communications that typically are conveyed you know rudely or um, just typically will try to it, it's really just meant to insult them even though the person is doing unconsciously so and there's some different things that come along with micro insults and these different themes are description of intelligence second class citizenship um, pathologizing cultural values um, communication styles and the assumption of criminal status and to get more specific in terms of what these different themes are, we talk about the description of intelligence. Um, it's assigning a degree of intelligence to a person based on, you know, th their color or their race. So basically, how they look or may typically look is someone saying, "Hey, you're a credit to your race." Um, basically, what that says in terms of the message is, people of color are generally not as intelligent as um, white people are. And then we get into second-class citizenship. It's when a person is treated as a lesser person or group. Um, a person of color, like a person of color who's mistaken for a service worker. So something like if you are a profession of color, person of color walking around your campus, someone always assumed, oh, you know, or do you work for, uh, or, you know, are you a custodial person or are you this, that, and the other. So basically making that assumption that you're always lesser than. So it, it basically comes from that old assumption that people of color are servants to whites or they couldn't possibly, possibly occupy a high status position. And then we go to pathologizing cultural values or communication style. This is the notion that the values and communication styles of people of color are abnormal. Um, and this is when a person, this is actualized by when a person dismiss, dis, dismissing an individual who brings up race or culture in a work setting. So every time someone talks about something that may be related to race or color, individuals in the room may say, oh, you're just pulling the race card or something of that nature, which is basically saying, you know what, it, it's not about race. So when in actuality, it may be something that's about race. So it's basically saying to them, why don't you just leave your cultural baggage outside of the room and we'll address this in a different way. So and then the last one um, in terms of micro insults is um, an assumption of criminal status. Um, and this is um, when a person of color is presumed to be a criminal, criminal, dangerous, or deviant based on race. Um, it's one of the examples that, they, uh, that Dr. Sue gives us in his book is a white person who raced to ride, ride the next elevator when a person of color is on it. So and another example that you know he also wrote in his book was when you know you're walking past someone or uh, if a black man is walking past a white woman and she clutches her purse as if he's going to steal it what those two messages send is that you are dangerous so and those are kind of you know the things that you know that are done sometimes unconsciously but can affect the individual who is affected by that microaggression and different from micro insults, micro invalidations actually talk about environmental cues that exclude or negate, you know, the psychological thoughts, feeling, feelings, or anything of a certain group, people of color, women, or LGBT uh, groups. So, you know, these tend to negate or so one of the best examples I can give that uh, Dr. Sue gave when he came to campus is if a person, you know, sees pictures, individuals that always represent someone that's different from them. So when they're in a room uh, uh, looking at a presentation and the entire panel is white or something of that nature. But some of the themes that go along with micro validations are um, one, being an alien in one's own land. Um, color blindness, which is one that's really, uh, really difficult to talk about a lot, and I'll tell you once we get to that. Myth of meritocracy and denial of individual racism. So in terms of alien in one's own land, this is the belief that a visible racial or ethnic minority citizens are foreigners. And this is typically targeted at Asian and Latino Americans. And because the questions that are typically asked are, you know, where were you born? Oh, you speak English very well. And the message that that sends is you are not an American. Um, and then we move on to colorblindness. And this is, you know, many years ago, colorblindness was seen as a thing that was perfectly OK. but uh, what that does in terms of color blindness, when, when a person says, when I look at you, I don't see color, that really denies a person's color or racial or ethnic experiences. It's saying, you know, well, there's no different experiences that you've had based on your color. That's what that message sends to that individual person of color. 
and then we move on to the myth of meritocracy, um, statements that assert race plays a minor role in life success. You know, and a person might say, I believe that the most qualified person should get the job. And what the, the message that that sends is that people of color are given extra unfair benefits because of their race. So you may be sitting in a, a hiring meeting or on a search committee and someone may say, oh, I think we should, you know, do this based on, you know, qualifications when everybody knows that we should do that, but it's something that somebody feels the need to mention anyway. And then the denial of individual racism. Um, uh, and this is uh, when a person will say, you know what, I'm not racist. I have several black friends, and, I'm, and I've heard this personally a lot. And what this says, or what this person is saying is that I'm immune to racism because I have friends of color. And you also see with uh, this with other underrepresented groups, I'm not homophobic because, you know, I have gay friends. So these kinds of things people will say when it's actually, you know, a microaggression to the individual that they're talking to. So, and, and now we have coming up, we actually, you know, have you know, some conversations that occurred from around the region, and Lovey will go into detail about those. Here are some conversations, and you can go ahead and, and kind of take a second and read these, that have actually um, come from um, students um, that we, you know, have interacted with and some issues that they have come across while being on campuses he, um, in, in the region. So along with those conversations come um, where we get our themes from. So when we talk about classroom experience or interacting with white students, um, these um, minority students have said this is where they interact um, with them the most in the classroom and they, they experience the most microaggressions from you know, white students or um, white professionals um, in the classroom. Um, some support systems um, that they will definitely need would be some sort of mentorship program or a multicultural affairs office where they can take um, their, you know, their issues to and those can be settled there. Um, they're feeling, you know, pressure with stereotypes or, or they're felt, have felt extra pressure, you know, trying to avoid stereotypes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, Faculty and tutors were not supportive. I think that's one that came up a lot. So, um, now we go on to the health effects. Um, Dr. Sue's book, Dr. Sue, his book um, says that these are some of the most um, common health effects that have happened uh, with minority students. And some of them that I kind of want to talk with you guys through, um, intrusive, intrusive cognition. Um, this happens when um, students are thought of being unwanted. So for example, you have a student that goes to a professor and says, you know, I need your help. And the professor continually says, you don't need my help. Well, then they don't feel comfortable asking that professor for help anymore because um, they feel like the professor, they're bothering the professor. He doesn't want, uh, you know, they don't want to bother him anymore. So that's kind of, they're feeling a little like they're being intrusive of that space. Also, um, loss of drive. A lot of students come in and they say, I'm going to college for my family or I'm going for myself. And, you know, if they don't have mentorship in place, then they kind of lose that drive to, um, to move forward. And so we want to make sure that we have someone in there in that place for, to be able to mentor them so that the way they can kind of, you know, have somewhere to go if something's going on and they can kind of feed that positive energy into them. Um, also, false positive, you know, for example, you give someone a good, hey, that was a great job, and you know, then somebody always looks to the negative. Well, I did that same thing the last time, and you didn't say the good job the last time. So all of these um, kind of roll into different health effects um, that affect uh, our minority students. Um, Dr. Sue also said that, or Dr. Smith, excuse me, said that students feel like they have to be switched on all the time, which means like I have to be professional all the time and I have to make sure that they see that I'm different. You know, I'm different from every minority student. I, I'm not holding up to a stereotype. So a lot of times you'll see minority students that are sitting, you know, with other minority students because it's comfortable and they don't have to be switched on all the time. Um, also, this is a, another reason uh, that kind of leads into why um, African American men have a higher rate of heart disease than white men. So we're going to look at some best practices so that way we can move forward. And this um, information will be also from Dr. Sue, his book. Um, here are a few things that we will be talking about. You can just take a look at those. 
All right, first one is to heal yourself. We have all had microaggressions done to us or we've been the person that has, you know, has been doing the microaggression, right? So now what we need to do is move forward. Let's not dwell on that. Let's see how we can combat that. Um, you know, hopefully something that we have said in this presentation will um, kind of give you an idea of how you can move forward with that. Like be in tune to your body and the things that you are saying so that way you can be aware of the way it comes off to people. And then you can share this information um, with faculty and staff or other people so that way, you know, we all are together helping to combat microaggressions. Um, continue with this knowledge. You know, not just take this um, presentation that we're giving you today and say, oh, that was great, but share this information so that way you're not perpetuating a stereotype. Okay, and the next best practice is expertise and trust. Um, just be aware of what's going on both on and off campus and have conversations with your students and other professionals so you know what certain microaggressions that your students are facing on an everyday basis. Um, and then just becoming more culturally aware of yourself and also your student culture and putting that into practice. And the next one is serving um, diverse populations. Just increase your understanding of different dynamics within your office but on, also on, on campus and just seeing different microaggression situations and practice on how you can intervene to make everyone involved more comfortable. Before I say these two um, points right here, there are the two authors that we keep mentioning, um, Dr. Daryl Wing Su. He's actually, I would say, the father of microaggressions. So he's done two books on microaggressions, and we'll put that. We have that in our reference section at the end. And we also talked about Dr. William Smith. So Dr. William Smith um, has actually coined the term racial battle fatigue. So you will see a lot of his work. Um, in terms of the racial battle fatigue, and we'll have that also in terms of the reference section at the end, and also in the archives, so you can pull those um, at your leisure. Um, the next uh, two best practices we want to talk about are hearing the voices of students of color. What better way to um, figure out what students of color need than to you know to sit down and actually have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them or focus groups with them, just to kind of figure out you know you know what's going on, you know how can you know we get you connected on campus? What things can we do to actually get you a, whether it's engaged in the classroom or engaged socially so that you can be successful you know, here at our institution. Um, and one of the um, best things that you also can do is top level commitment. You know, it's one thing for whether it's staff of color that are entry level or mid level and students of color to say this is what I need or this is what I'm feeling, but it's another thing for senior level administrators that are, whether it's deans, vice presidents, or even the president of the institution saying, you know what, there are some things that we need to do to make um, a bias-free work environment or a bias-free classroom for our students. And I want, you know, whether it's faculty to go through this training or we need to do this in terms of making students feel more welcome on our campus. So top level commitment is definitely important when you want to proceed with doing some different things on your campus. And once you have you know, all of those pieces done in terms of talking to the students, getting some top level commitment, it's great to come up with a vision statement and plan. Um, a lot of times we, you know, some people say committees are where things go to die. And a lot of times people will just put together a committee or slap together an office and say, OK, we put something down on paper or we have an office here, everything's great. But we really need to be intentional about, you know, and having clear objectives you know, in terms of being able to meet the needs of, you know, minority students and students of color on campus. So in order to create that welcoming environment and to minimize those disparities in the organization or in the classroom, it's great to have those clear objectives um, and an actual multicultural and diversity action plan for the university to be able to achieve and to be able to make all students feel welcome on campus. And then there are some recommendations that we have as uh, presenters in terms of the entire system. And some of these we, we've uh, previously mentioned, but in terms of the actual system, having a mentorship program for students of color, um, elimination of tokenism in the classroom. Now, this is a, definitely extremely difficult for us as staff members. But it's um, you know if you get if you're able to get you know the the top down commitment from you know senior level administrators and have that action plan in place and hopefully there are some things that can be taught to our our faculty members that can show elimination of tokenism in the classroom and as on our end we can you know make sure that whether it's in our staff meetings or in whatever meetings that we're having with students making sure that we're not making students represent an entire race or culture. 
Um, and having honesty regarding the campus and surrounding community dynamics. A lot of times we hear students um, say, you know what, when I was when I heard about the university or when somebody was talking to me about it, they didn't tell me that this is what the culture was like on campus. So being honest with those students is very important so that they're not blindsided or not surprised once they arrive on campus. There is going to be a certain level of culture shock anyway once a student arrives to campus, but we want to make sure we can minimize that by telling them this is the way things are on campus, but this is what we do to support you on our campus. Um, and then promoting the surrounding community. If you have things that you feel like students would, you know, uh, uh, can connect with, whether it's, you know, uh, different organizations off campus, different groups, or different activities, then connect them with those so that they feel like, you know what, this is a great community, this is a welcome environment, so that they know that it's more than just the college community, but also the surrounding community. And then a lot of universities are starting to establish, or have already established, an Office of Equity and Inclusion, or Diversity Affairs Office, that focuses on you know, uh, underrepresented students, staff members, and faculty members to make sure that they you know, feel like they have a place on campus. And when there, something does go wrong, they're able to have that office that can intercede and, and, and help them to work through those issues. And then as individuals, what, what we can do is acknowledge that a problem does exist. You know, is our, you know, do we need to do some different things on our campus for our underrepresented students, for our minority students? And understand yourself as a race, racial and cultural being that you do have culture as well, um, no matter what your cultural background is. Um, acknowledge one's own cultural conditioning and biases. Acknowledge the way that you grew up, that you, know, you may have grew up a certain way, but that may not be the way that you are now in terms of trying to become better. Um, in terms of serving your students. Understand and make sense of one's own emotions. You know, try to understand, you know, this is the way I grew up and this is why I have these emotions. And then, you know, take some steps in order to be able to overcome those, whether it's reading, attending sessions, counseling, or whatever is necessary for you to overcome those. And then, then learn accurate information rather than stereotypes. A lot of time, especially with our students, they'll get information about other cultures from television, magazines, and whatever other unreliable source that they can think of instead of the actual individual. So if I want to learn you know, more about African American people, I'm going to talk to African American people, African American students, Latino students, Asian students, and down the line to get a better understanding of what these students need on our campus. And then learn, again, learn, like I previously said, learn about minorities from other strong minorities so that you can get a great grasp on what it is you need to do to serve your students and understanding that each student is different and being able to meet that individual need of those students. And then learn by being committed to personal action against racism. So if you, you know, you need to make, whether it's your own personal statement and your own personal stance, whether it's, you know, when you hear someone say a joke, being able to interject and say, no, that's, that's not appropriate or that's not funny or I prefer you not say those types of things around me. And then understand that cultural competency is a lifelong process. This is not going to be, I listened to a webinar or I went to a workshop series over a weekend and now I know everything there is there that I need to know about cultural competency and diversity. And understanding that things are always changing, times are always changing, so it's always important for us to stay you know, ahead and on top of different knowledge, whether it's reading books and attending these different sessions on a regular basis to keep up with everything that's going on in our society. So, and these are the references that we spoke of before. So, and, and you all will have that in the archive, so you can see uh, Dr. Uh, William Smith's book, and then two books by Dr. Sue, and then some of the health information that we received from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Well, at this time, we'll be able to take any questions that have already come in and questions that you feel like you want to type in now at, at, on the box in the corner. Sorry guys, I'm having technical difficulties right now. <laughs> I went ahead and assigned a couple questions over your way, Herbrina. Are you able to see those? My computer is shut, shut down on me, so I'm logging back in right now. Okay. Um, how about I uh, just reroute these over to Marcus in the meantime. Marcus, go ahead and pull up your uh, screen, and you'll be able to see a couple questions that came in. Thank you. All right, the first question.
question that I see is, concerning focus groups, how do you balance the opportunity to learn about the student experience at your institution with, with not making the student feel like ambassadors, representatives, or speakers for their race if that's not a label they want to have? I can take that unless one of y'all want to take it. Shoot. Go ahead. OK. Um, one of the things we typically, I've typically done on our campus is uh, ask for volunteers. So we ask students who are interested in you know, just being a part of focus groups to make things better for um, you know, the, the incoming group of students that are coming in. Because I did a focus group at the end of last year because I work with a conditional admit program. And I emailed all the students that I work with individually and said, hey, I'm going to be getting together a focus group. Uh, because I want to find out how your school year went and also find out how we can make um, things better for the next group of students that are coming in the next year. You don't have to do it, but you know, I would be more than happy to have you there. And I sent the email out to about 10 students, and I ended up getting eight students there. So um, I think it's one of those things where you just offer the opportunity, um, and if students want to participate, they will. And if they don't, then they won't. So that's the best I can tell you in terms of that. Another question is, how do you work with students on a campus when the minority student is the majority? Do the same healing tactics apply when the microaggressions may be reversed? It's a good question. <laughs> um, I personally, I have, in terms of microaggressions, I've only worked with students of color that have been, um, I guess, victims of microaggression, and I have not. Um, researched anything in Dr. Darrell Wing Sue's uh, books and his articles in terms of that, but that may be something that um, I would encourage you all to look up in terms of his books, because he has a lot of information out there. He has two books out. He has even videos on YouTube in terms of how to interact with those microaggressions. So that may be something that um, actually takes further research in terms of understanding that, especially when you know the, the groups are reversed in terms of the dominant group and um, culture. And someone also said, we wanted to know your opinion on required diversity trainings. Can you repeat that question again? Yes, someone wants to know, what, are, what do we think of required diversity trainings? So if you have required diversity trainings on your campus, what, what are your thoughts on having those? I, I think the word required kind of makes it, you know, like people want to back off of that, but it's definitely necessary, especially if you have institutions, you know, where you have a small uh, a minority population and a large majority population. Um, I think it would be helpful, but like I said, I think the word required just kind of puts that, that negative tone on it, and then people are just kind of, you know, begrudgingly doing it, and they don't really want to actually understand what's going on. They just are doing it because they have to. Um, not that, you know, the word required is bad and, you know, for a lot of our training it is required, but I think sometimes that word just puts a negative connotation on things and then it's more of a, you know, a begrudging thing than uh, actually want to learn about this. Okay. Yeah, and our, I mean, recently um, we've had, you know, we have diversity trainings every year here at Grand Valley State University, but recently our dean of students sent out something that says, hey, we're going to do these trainings on this day. Um, every so often, and everybody's required to attend, because I think his approach in the past has been, here are some optional trainings to go to. And I think when his, I think his feelings are that individuals weren't taking advantage of that, and we still need that at our institution. So since you don't want to go, I'm going to make you go. So and I think it, it, it may come with some negative you know connotation um, with that in terms of saying required or you know it's mandatory. But I think when you're when you know it's needed, and an individual continues to say, I don't need it, then at some point, you know, top level administrators will say, okay, I understand what you're saying, but for the needs of our students, this is what we're going to do. So I think in the end, it's all about what's best for our students. Um, another I question agree. is, go ahead, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Marcus. Oh, yeah, go I ahead. agree with everything that Marcus said, um, let me say. Um, if you put the required in front of it, it seems kind of like negative said. It shows that the students that you actually care that the differences that they bring to the table. And so if you're not having it, just questioning whether or not, you know, are we really doing this for our students or not. So yeah, I agree with both of you guys. Okay. And then there's a question. There's a lot of questions. Um, 
how do you provide that safe net when you're on a campus where staff and faculty members have the mentality that I didn't see it, so it's not happening? Or that in the, yeah. yeah. You say you want me to repeat it? Yeah. Okay. The question is, how do you provide that safe net when you're on a campus where staff and faculty members have the mentality that I didn't see it, so it's not happening? So they're saying that I, I don't see any of these microaggressions or any of this racism happening, so it's not happening since I don't actually visibly see it. Is there, I, I would assume, and, and this is just an assumption, and maybe maybe I'm wrong, if there was a, um, a diversity affairs uh, department, that those could be taken to that department just to kind of get things documented and take it, take, taken down. You know, maybe nothing can be done at that moment, but when you document information or things that have happened, you know, enough document, documentation can make something happen, you know, to where, like, hey, we're going to make sure that you, you see this. Like, you keep saying you don't see it but it's here, and here's the things that we've documented to show you that this is going on. And another question is, uh, a lot of our references were about managing microaggressions in the classroom. What about in other environments of campus life? Um, in, in Dr. Seuss' book, he talks, about, he talks about the classroom, he talks about outside of the classroom, he breaks it down by uh, African Americans, Latino Americans, Native Americans, Asian Americans, um, but he breaks it down by staff. So in his book, he actually breaks it down in, in almost every possible way that we can think of. He even talks about, you know, whether it's people of color, LGBT groups, women, and he breaks it down on how um, those microaggressions will typically come across for those individuals. So I would encourage you all to, and a lot of, a lot of his books are actually available digitally. I was able to pull it up um, here at our institution, and we had it digitally, and I was able to pull it up, pull up the PDF and actually look through the entire book and pull out uh, what we needed for our presentation. So I would encourage you all to look through that as well. The next question is, what are some of the most common microaggressions that are brought to your attention as a student affairs professional? I think in my experience so far, um, it's the student, you know, please speak on behalf of your race because they're, you know, the only student of color in a classroom. So I think I've had a lot of students that have experienced that mostly. Um, I would say uh, not most students, of, well, minority students, not being um, included in certain things, social activities, um, especially over the weekend in some places where they're away from home and they don't have anywhere to go. And so they see like their roommates or other majority students, they have other activities to go to, but they never get that invite. So always not being included in social activities. Yeah, and I would piggyback off for Brenda in terms of social activities. One of the things that I've seen uh, at even my institution and other institutions are when we talk about homecoming. I think <laughs> um, a lot of times students are, in terms of homecoming, in terms of the themes and things that uh, are done with that, students will say, you know, in terms of the activities that are offered, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go to that because I feel like that's not, you know, something that, you know, I would like or there's not a, a a, a diversity of activities in terms of me being able to go to something that's different and also something that I'm familiar with. So I think that's one of the things. But one of the things I hear most is uh, classroom, in terms of the classroom. And I think it's uh, whether it's faculty and tutors, what I hear most from my students is that they feel like that uh, professors and tutors treat them like they're less than in terms of they have less intelligence. So they, even one of my students said to me that, you know, they refer, she even used the term you people when working with one of my students. So I had to actually find out who that tutor was. And, and now I'm kind of talking with our tutor and center in terms of what can we do to help you know our students that are working with other students to make sure that they're not committing these microaggressions as well. Because now the students are like, I don't want to go back to the tutoring center anymore if all of the tutors are thinking this way about me, thinking that I'm coming in there with less intelligence just because you know I want some tutoring. I think some of that also, you know, affects students to the point where they're just like, I don't want to ask for help because I don't want people to think that I don't know what I'm doing or I don't know what I'm going, what's going on. So I don't think it's just dealing with tutoring. I think that's more of a, 
you know, a whole thing. Like, I'm not asking for help because I don't want people to think that I don't know what's going on. So it's, I think it's more than just, you know, in that situation. And someone wrote, uh, actually wrote a comment in terms of the required training, and I'm going to jump back to that really quickly. He says, I think that we're, this is from, uh, it looks like, Pierre Richardson, um, and it says, I think that required training is essential as these conversations are very difficult to have, so they will not happen on their own on a larger scale, so institutions have to be intentional about these conversations, and I completely agree with that. And we have a couple more questions. Um, it says, how do you engage white students in helping to facilitate conversations about microaggressions? I mean, I think a simple way, like kind of what we've been talking about, is, is simple training. If you have student staff members, whether they're resident assistants or um, work-study students, simple things like, you know, having these conversations with them, you know, regardless of who it's with, it's not going to be an easy conversation to have, but it is necessary. So, you know, maybe giving that required training, you know, in an RA session for training or in, you know, a work-study session or, or things like that. I mean, it's those are things that they have to be at, you know, those training sessions. So it's easy to say this is what we're going to start incorporating. Or if you have more of a larger student population, student leadership population, depending on your, what your training consists of with that, you know, if you guys do like a monthly student leadership get together where you talk about, you know, specific issues, that can be an issue that you can talk about one one month or, you know, give them some questions to think about, you know, as they're going through their day life, even if you have, you know, just normal students in a residence hall, like, and you have a residence assistant that's doing programs, like, give them questions or give them things that would challenge them to, to think about these things. So um, as, as, hard as, those, as hard as those conversations will be, they are necessary. So any little way that you can kind of get those in and into their mind and so they can be thinking, I think that'll be helpful for, for them as a, um, a student. Yeah, I think also even providing maybe certain case studies that you can you that you can talk over with your students, so you can work through like if they do see a microaggression, like how does that look, in what ways can they help the student that's involved with it, or even um, how can they stand up when they see microaggressions happen on campus. So. Yeah, and I agree with that because I mean just keep in mind that we have a, a, a groups of students that are tied to us and like. You know, Lovey was talking about in terms of our student leaders, our RAs, or the students that work at our desk, or the students that are part of our, our community councils, um, students that are part of student government, uh, anybody that's actually tied to the institution, whether it's working or in a leadership position, those are the students that are easiest or and best to go after in terms of their leadership position and actually training them and talking to them about these different microaggressions. So just getting it on their brains and in their minds will help, you know, to actually kind of change some of that culture on campuses. The next question is, how do you ensure that other departments within student affairs are involved? The onus shouldn't be squarely within multicultural affairs offices. Well, I would I would suggest that this this has to really, this is when we really look at that piece where we talk about um, getting top level commitment. Because you know, typically you have multicultural affairs, housing, student life, and all these different offices that are either under a VP of student affairs or under a dean of students office. And getting that dean or VP um, to e either buy in or work with them and get them to understand that is, is one of the key pieces. It may be difficult, but it's one of the things to understand to get you know everyone involved. So our dean, like I said, is is putting it on the his entire division to you know, get specific training to be able to help our students. Otherwise, we're going to overwork a particular office, whether it's you know, the Office of Multicultural Affairs, whether it's the Counseling Center, whether it's the Office of, office of Equity and Inclusion. But actually being able to um, get everybody in on the training, getting them to understand that you know, we can't overtax a particular office is something that I think has to come from uh, whether it's senior level leadership to be able to lead that, uh, lead that charge. Hey, uh, one another question is: What are some successful methods you've applied to engage faculty of color in helping to address racial microaggressions, especially at research-based institutions where tenure is more important than assisting with campus issues? 
repeat that question, Marcus? Yes. What are some successful successful methods you've applied to engage faculty of color in helping to address racial microaggressions, especially at research-based institutions where tenure is more important than assisting with campus issues? I honestly do not have an answer to that question. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of, and the engaging faculty of color is, I mean, is, is a very important role. But I think it's tenure. Tenure is when things can get really, really difficult. But mm -hmm. a lot of the times, I we I've typically worked with or engaged those faculty that I know are interested in helping, genuinely helping, you know, students of color and other marginalized groups on campus. And those individuals are the ones that I will typically just work with over and over and over again. And even though there are some individuals that I know are like, look, I, I have tenure. I don't need to be bothered with this, but I think going after the ones or trying to appeal, you know, to the ones that are that are actually genuinely interested in working with you. So I think it may just be a, asking, you know, asking a series of individuals. So whether if there's, you know, 20, you know, faculty of color on your campus, actually approaching each individual one, ask them, are you interested in helping me with this work? And you know, and I, my guess is that you will find, you know, several individuals that are willing to do that. And most of them are more willing than most of us think. So even though that they have tenure already. Um, one of the questions is in the in the books that you referenced for this presentation, they were were they both focused on race, or did the authors address student subcultures? For example, athletes, Greeks, disabled students, non-traditional students. If not, do either of you have any thoughts on addressing those types of microaggressions? Well, in, in terms of what's in the actual books, and then I can, you know, yield to, you know, Harbrina and Lovey in terms of, you know, some things that we can do. In terms of the books, I did not see anything in particular to those specific specific subgroups that you mentioned. But like I said before, we he did talk about um, he, he broke it down by specific uh, racial and uh, ethnic groups, and he did uh, talk about LGBT students and women. So those are what I specifically know was in the book. So and there's he's still developing more books and articles, you know, on the topic of microaggressions. But some of the things that were mentioned can be applied to some of the, you know, whether it's disabled students and non-traditional students and Greeks in terms of what, you know, those microaggressions are. And a lot of that has to, a lot of that will come from the students actually identifying, you know, the way they feel or the way they've been addressed. And the more that those things are recorded, the more we can understand from those different groups. Yeah, I would say just having conversations with the the students in those those groups, just seeing what kind of um, situations they have been faced with, uh, what microaggressions that come up to them. That's what I would say. Yeah. And I would agree. Okay. And we have two more questions. One question is, what is some advice you would give to institutions that do not provide housing and all the students commute to campus? Can you repeat that again? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. What is some advice you would give to institutions that do not provide housing and all the students commute to campus? I want, I'm wondering if that um, wh whoever asked the questions has um, a diversity affairs office there or not. Because um, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, and if we're and um, if, we're, if we're talking about specifically addressing microaggressions, um, then I think one of the things you do is look to at that point. That's when you do look to an office that actually specializes in working with things like that. Whether it's an office of or multicultural affairs or an office of diversity affairs, actually looking at them in terms of how to be able to address that. So I think that's one of the key things you could do in terms of that. If you don't have the capacity because you're already working with, you know, you don't have the RAs and those kind of things to be able to teach students that way. So whether it's going after the student leaders and whether it's going after um, other individuals that are in positions of leadership, I think there are other ways you can approach it um, that are non-housing related. And another question is, what is what is some advice you would give to institutions that do not, wait, no, that's, I already read that one. It is, should there be judicial action or not 
if so, if this is in terms of should there be judicial action or not, um, if a white student doesn't allow a black student to cross their path and tells the black student you are three-fifths a person and the black student reports it. I, I would say, like yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a serious <laughs> situation, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think on a, we we would on our campus we would consider that to be a biased incident. So and that would go straight to our dean of students' office. So that's where that's how I mean we treat it because that's a it's, that's a direct racial attack on that individual. Right, because that makes that individual not feel comfortable in their surroundings right, whenever they right. see that person. It's one of those things where the individual was like, hey, I don't. At least at that point, I don't know if I feel safe because I don't know what this person is going to do or what they're a part of in terms of, you know, trying to come after me in that way. So. I think a little bit of that could probably um, maybe even fall under some Title IX issues as well as um, forms of harassment. So, um, yes, it definitely needs to be in the judicial process, but it may go a little bit further than just, you know, what, the insti what various institutions do. It may actually get into, um, like, a larger thing, and Title IX, it may fall under that. Okay. okay, I'm trying to filter through all of our questions. Okay. I think we, I think we got them all. I think we got them all. And I'm going to let Lovey, can you, oh, you already have our contact information already up. So if we don't have any more questions, I think that's it. Thank you today. Uh, this is a great presentation, and if any of you have, come up with questions. Oh. yeah, I was just saying, if any of you do have questions, please feel free to follow up directly with the presenters with their contact information here. Um, we will be posting a recording of this webinar on the Glacujo website within about two days, so we can try to get that up there tomorrow or Monday. Um, we've had a couple requests as well for a link to the Prezi so that folks can actually review the Prezi later. So I'll be working with our presenters today to see if we can't get a link up on the website also. Um, I'm going to check in with our presenters one last time and find out if we have any closing, uh, anything just to close with today. Presenters? Yeah, I would say feel free to contact um, any of us, whether it's via email or if we have our other information up, Twitter, Facebook, um, any of those methods, if you have questions about the, specifically about the presentation. I just wanted to chime in. My name is Kiana Stone. I'm the chair for the Contemporary Issues Committee, and I would like to thank our presenters um, for providing us with this informative presentation today. Uh, there are a lot of resources out there. Um, our Contemporary Issues Committee will continue to look at um, this topic as well as our overarching topic, if you are not familiar, which is the recruitment and retention of professional staff of color within our region to housing in our institution, so continue to look for articles. Um, we will have definitely um, a variety of presentations at um, our annual conference that our committee will also be sponsoring, as well as our upcoming articles, like I stated, um, within trends, in the upcoming trends. So please be on the lookout for that. If you have any questions, definitely feel free to go to the Glucuo website um, and click the link for our committee. Um, we also have a Facebook fan page as well. So if you have questions or feedback um, and want to continue the conversation and share resources that um, we didn't share today, definitely add that to our fan page um, on Facebook if you're on Facebook or email that out and we can definitely get that information out and continue this conversation as, in terms of helping our students. And one, one last piece that I wanted to add is there is a website, actually, microaggressions.com, and it's actually um, a Tumblr page that um, individuals can submit actual microaggressions that have occurred to them. And this site has, I mean, hundreds if not thousands of submissions of things that have occurred to them. So if you even want to see more examples of microaggressions that occur you know, on a daily basis, even outside of the classroom, that's a great website to check out, microaggressions.com. All right, thank you again, presenters. Fabulous job today. Uh, we appreciate your presentation. And then audience members, we appreciate you tuning in. Um, I do want to quick announce that we have a couple more webinars coming up in the next week or two. 
you can check those out on our website, lukuho.org. As always, our webinars are provided free of charge as professional development opportunities for our region. Um, that's it for today. We'll look for the re webinar recording on our website starting tomorrow on Monday, and have a great weekend, everybody. Bye-bye.